We all know something about Medusa, the mythological figure with writhing snakes instead of hair, who turns those who look directly at her to stone, and who lost her head to Perseus's sword. The sculptures of Antonio Canova, Benvenito Cellini, Bernini, and for that matter, 1981's Clash of the Titans hints at a familiar story. But what about Medusa on the wild side in her seemingly endless variations? Can we make sense of those? Rubens modeling his Medusa of biological nightmare and nature run amok on Lucan's Pharsalia. The femme fatale, seductress Medusa. The monstrous and hideous Medusa. The Marvel Comics Medusa calling fans to an early 1970 version of Comic-Con. The hip, sexy, stylish icon of the Gianni Versace fashion empire. The gorgeously horrific and androgynous Medusa watching herself die in the mirror of Perseus's polished shield. The once and still beautiful mournful Medusa who in Ovid's version wasn't seduced by Poseidon as in Hesiod's version, but was rather violated by him in the garden of Athena's temple and punished by Athena for desecrating her temple with a curse of writhing snakes and utter and absolute loneliness. Anyone who glanced upon her was turned to stone. The feminist icon Medusa, Gustav Klimt's dreamy, erotic, decadent, and fan de siècle Medusa, Medusa written on the body, and Medusa always, always being reborn. If you turn from this world of different Medusas and look to classical sources to find the real Medusa, what you'll discover instead is that Homer, Hesiod, Ovid, and Lucan, and countless other classical writers are almost as varied in their treatment of Medusa as our own present-day versions. Her appearance in Homer's The Odyssey nearly 3,000 years ago stresses the apotropaic, or ability to ward off evil power of her image on shields, confirming she was already a known figure in culture and myth, stretching back to preliterate times, and we can infer Medusa's stories sung or chanted around nighttime fires, singers of tales changing the story a bit with every telling. But here's the gist of what has come down from classical times. Medusa was one of three sibling Gorgons. Her two sisters were immortal, but Medusa is mortal. Both Ovid and Hesiod agree Medusa was a beautiful woman, but everything changed after Poseidon seduced Medusa in the fragrant, damp meadow. Does Hesiod mean fragrant, damp meadow in both senses of that image? Yes, he does. In Ovid, Medusa is a lovely young woman with lots of suitors. He singles out her gorgeous hair and declares he learned that detail from someone who had seen it. It makes it all so personal. But then, when Poseidon comes to her, it isn't to court her, or woo or seduce her, and it isn't in the fragrant damp meadow. Medusa is violated in Athena's temple. Ovid uses the word Widiasa, defined is to defile, violate, injure, or ruin. Consider what Athena, enraged by what she views as the desecration of her temple, actually does not to the perpetrator, but to the victim. 
Substituting writhing snakes for Medusa's beautiful hair is the least of it. Athena dooms Medusa to the most desolate of lives. Imagine you are Medusa, and really, you are, since it core myth is something that lives within us, and you are desperately craving a word, a touch, a shared glance with another. You hear approaching voices, one flash of exultation, and then the grim truth crashes back into you. Stay away! Stay away! Stay away! And these were the same words you said to Poseidon in the garden, but now you cannot speak and your eyes fail. You are neither living nor dead, and you know nothing but desolation looking into the heart of light, the silence. Un lair das mer, empty and forsaken is this world. They keep approaching and glancing towards you. They die into statuary in that glance. So utterly alone in a wasteland of increasing hordes of stone statues bleaching to white under the burning sun, Medusa lives on. Now does what haunted George Eliot as the terrible sadness and terrible beauty of the Rondonini Medusa make sense, or what Goethe termed of that statue's unspeakable, anguished stare of death. Let's return now to 1981's Clash of the Titans. The flying winged horse, that's Pegasus sired by Poseidon and Medusa, it emerged from Medusa at the moment of her slaying. Perseus will ride this horse, carrying Medusa's head with him, to save that woman bound in cuffs and chains to the rock. That's Andromeda. But who really is Perseus? Well, it starts with his parents, Danae and Zeus. Danae, for complicated reasons, was imprisoned in a cell, and Zeus, knowing much of the spirit and charms of Danae, came to her, and while he could not break into the cell, flooded her from above with a golden shower, impregnating her, and nine months later, she gave birth to Perseus. Artists by the hundreds have painted this primal scene of Perseus's conception. Most tamely literalize it as a painting of a cascade of golden coins. But Jean Gossart's 1527 Danae gets it beautifully right, and her face is just divine. But it is Gustav Klimt who captures the core of the scene. Zeus's flood becomes Danae's flood, his rapture becomes Danae's rapture. Of such an interfusion is Perseus conceived. Now there's a point here to make about Perseus and the nature of myth. Back to Caravaggio's Medusa for a second to help make it. Hundreds of critics have tried to explain Medusa's strange erotic appeal, and without much success, they point to the androgynous, phallic woman, the literal femme fatale, her dual citizenship in a world of the human and the world of the monstrous, her immense strength. And so the list goes on. Caravaggio's Medusa, which is simultaneously the most horrific, the most fascinating, the most darkly appealing, and in some ways the most fiercely erotic Medusa image of all, we tend to want to claim the ta tame the classical world, but it's pointless to do so. Eros and all sorts of beautiful transgressions are always spilling out of those amphoras, and Caravaggio knew it to his bones. His androgynous, phallic, powerful, feminine, astonished Medusa is such a delicious mix-up. It reminds me of the surrealist André Breton saying, Beauty must be convulsive or not be at all. You have to shake up convention, or you're just repeating a surface ideal. Myths are lovely because they work on so many levels simultaneously. And the one I'm pointing to here isn't the crucial one, but it does somewhere deep in our psyches add a bit of acetylene to the fire. Now look at Perseus. He is conceived in a golden shower and he is just tangled with one of the most perversely and transgressively erotic figures in all mythology, and now he's about to speed off on his horse to rescue a girl in bondage. 
If you ever think there are edgy, perverse, neurotically transgressive subtexts in classical mythology, you are right, and they have always been there. Try to tame myth, and you pluck out one core of its energy and one core of its beauty. Myth ultimately spills out of the unconscious, out of dreams, and out of tales, sung or chanted around the night fire, fueled by night energies and enchantments and the whispering thrum of the witchy unknown just beyond the pale. We know these worlds are fiercely erotic, wildly imaginative, beyond the reach of censorship, convention, or for that matter, binary thinking. It's part of what fuels the fire, and it's part of the fire that fuels the many stunning versions of Medusa that live today. Thank you for watching this video. I will keep making them. This gives me a chance to return to subjects I've thought about for 30 or more years. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe.